Tēnā katoa katoa, kia ora everybody. My name is Jan Hai. How do we get the best out of our people? How do we nurture leadership within our communities? And what are the factors that enable us to nurture that leadership? I'm here in Wellington and in Dunedin is Margie Jean Malcolm, accompanied by Bronwyn Boone and Lani Evans. And we're going to present to you today's web team, webinar, Resilient Leadership Amidst Complexity. So we'll just give you a wave to say hello. Before we, do, before we start, I'm going to ask David to play us a brief video of introduction. Everyone, welcome to Resilient Leadership Amidst Complexity, a community research webinar presented by Dr. Margie Jean Malcolm. Today's event will be hosted by me, Jan Hind, of Community Research, and joining Margie Jean in Dunedin will be Dr. Bronwyn Boone and Lani Evans. Here in Wellington, I have Peter Glenser with me, who will be our chat master and chat invigorator, and the event will be supported by David Blair, a technician in Auckland. So we're broadcasting to you today from three locations. And here's our agenda. This will be a 70 to 90 minute event, and you'll see that Margie Jean is going to break up her presentation and invite questions and comments from you as her audience. So we'll encourage you to interact today, put your questions to Margie Jean, to Bronwyn or to Lani, um, and um, they will stay behind to interact a little at the end as well. I will be presenting some resources which can also be found as links on the community research website. And today's event will be recorded and will be available immediately on the Community Research YouTube page for sharing or reviewing. So here's how to ask a question. If you're on Google+, the top right-hand corner of your screen, this Rubik's Cube shape will reveal the Q&A button. If you're on YouTube, you need to join the conversation on the chat bar. Or you can tweet us, hashtag goodresearch or at goodresearch. So now's the time to get yourself a cup of tea, play with your controls, you can't break anything. And also we would say this is a Google Hangout on air. It's normal to expect some delays, particularly in the handover between presenters. Things do take a couple of seconds. If, however, your sound is buffering or if you're experiencing a time lag between speech and slides, the chances that the problem is at your end and is to do with your speed or bandwidth of your connection. So thanks from the community research team. Thanks from the Kaitiaki of community research. We're loving working with Hangouts on Air. We'd love you to tell us how you think we're doing because we think it's a great way to share learnings within the community sector. So please complete our short survey. And thanks for joining us today. So there's a slight delay working with Hangouts on Air does create delays, that's normal. And that's because we're broadcasting from different locations and um, because we're working through the medium of Hangouts. So when it comes to your comments and your questions for Margie Jean, Bronwyn or Lani, don't be shy, jump in and put your questions. I'm actually just going to briefly show them to you. Put your questions to Peter Glanzer, who's here in the background, invigorating your chat. So Margie Jean Malcolm, I think I may have mistakenly made you a doctor. <laughs> Too soon there, Margie, but uh, Margie Jean, um, you're a former and founding director of community research. Um, you former senior lecturer with Unitech not for profit management and now an independent, a sole trader doing some great thinking for us. And we're delighted that you're here today to join us and present your thinking um, around resilient leadership in amidst complexity. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you without further ado. In a mana, in a reo, in a rangatira ma, in a hoe fa, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Welcome, people of the four winds out there in cyberspace with us. <laughs> Ko Magijin Malcolm Maho, no kotarana, me airana, o kutipuna. Kai otoputi, toku kainga, a nayane. I honour my Scottish and my Irish ancestors and the generations before me who have role modelled in so many different ways what it means to be an active citizen. They have inspired my lifetime engagement in community development 
and supported me through all the ups and downs of living what the Malcolm clan motto calls, um, they strive for difficult things. <clears throat> this webinar offers a perspective on resilient leadership amidst complexity. I encourage you not to try and take in all the detail, but to notice the patterns, the images, the ideas that resonate for you, and what might that make possible to stretch your thinking about how we, how we think and how we act in creative ways in community change. Community development, change and innovation is really complex. It calls for resilient leadership. And it requires us to access everyone's potential to be active citizens, so that we can all lead from whatever our role, whether in our family, in our whanau, in our hapu, in our iwi, in our community organisation, in our workplace, perhaps even parliament. <laughs> Yet there's this typical self-effacing response from Kiwis, and myself included, that says, who, me? I don't think of myself as a leader. So we've got to get through that somehow and figure out how we enable everybody to see and play their part as active citizens, bring it, building strong, resilient communities. So here's our roadmap of where we're going today. Our starting point will be to unpack and question some of our own assumptions about this whole leadership word. It's a very loaded word, and we can really get in the way of us all seeing ourselves as active citizens. Next, we're going to explore a different lens on leadership as learning. And we're going to unpack some of the different layers of that leadership. And then we're going to finish with a few key messages about complexity thinking, which has strongly influenced the ideas presented here. It's a new science way of understanding complex systems and their remarkable capacity to learn, adapt, and self organize. This whole perspective on leadership has grown out of research with people enabling and exercising leadership amidst complex community contexts. Unitech's not-for-profit management program graduates and teaching team, and the Inspiring Communities leadership team. It's great to have Lani here with us today, who's participated in the Unitech learning community, and Bronwyn, who's been an incredibly supportive um, person all the way through the, the research journey through to, yes, actually finishing the PhD, Jan. I am allowed to claim the doctor label, but I don't often use it. What supports the emergence of civil society leadership was the central research question driving two action research cycles. The first action research cycle was with the Unitech program to inform a rewrite of the program for which is for people leading community organisations. And the second research cycle was with inspiring communities, focusing on harvesting our learning from community-led development practice. Appreciative inquiry, journaling and collaborative inquiry workshops supported our noticing, our reflecting and our sense-making about our practice. The core value at the heart of both research cycles was a real commitment to researching with each other, not doing research on others. The ideas, the imagery and the patterns that I'll share with you today emerged as we made sense of what we were seeing. The real validation of the research comes in how it's relevant for you as practitioners. As John Heron so wisely said about this kind of research, it works because it's true and it's true because it works. I love that summing up because it's saying, you know, we're drawing um, our wisdom from our practice in order to actually inform our practice. How practical can you get is that? But the most important thing for you to remember is that this is not a model or a recipe that we're presenting. It's rather a way of thinking and acting and leading amidst complexity. So my clearest instruction for you is to to really be clear about, it's not a recipe, so you don't have to remember all the ingredients. Just please treat the seminar as like an experience of working with complexity. You grab the bits that resonate with you, you deal with the things and the doable little bits you can take away and make use of, but you're not trying to understand every little detail. Also, just try and think about specific situations that this reminds you of and contextualize it for yourself in terms of making it real. We'll be trying to do that with lots of practical examples as we go along the way. 
So first thing, I want you to go to that Q&A box that Jan's already told you about, and I want you to type in the very first word that comes to your mind when I say the leadership word. I'm going to get Bronwyn and Lani to get us going, and Jan will feed back your ones as soon as Lani and, and Bronwyn have take, told me their one word. One word? Yep. Uh, relationship. Relationship. Facilitation. <coughs> Facilitation. What's coming through at your end, Jan? What are those words? We're just waiting, still waiting for, there's a little bit of a time lag, but as far as leadership is concerned, um, I'm going to jump in with um, uh, strength, intelligence. Any others coming from other people? Three. Are you out there in cyber say somewhere, people? Just type in your chat, in your Q&A box, just a, a, a word or two. I'll tell you what, we'll keep, reading those, we'll keep relaying those as they come through. You keep relaying them and I'll get Bronwyn and Lani to keep thinking of some other ones. <laughs> Do some devil's advocate ones as well. And, uh, um, organizing. Organizing. Innovation. Innovation. Innovate, uh, no, not innovating, energizing. The, yes. other, the opposite, energizing. Energizing. Uh, composure. Yeah. Yes. Um, mm. Mm. Vision. Scheduling. Scheduling. Yeah. Pressure. Pressure, yeah. Can cope under pressure at all costs, yes. There we are. Okay. Rosh, Roshana. What does it say? Let's hear the words from Jan's end. <laughs> we can't read it. Good evening. Good evening. No, we can't read that. Okay. Typically, when we're doing this live in a, in, in a workshop, we have a whole whiteboard full of, full of words by now. And often it ranges from, it, it builds up this whole huge list that feels like a bit like a, a Superman or a Superwoman image. Um, so the key, have any more come through, Jen? Otherwise, we might just keep going. Okay. That was an experiment worth trying to engage you. At least if you've started, if you're out there in the webinar and if you haven't written something down, at least you've started to think about your words. Because as soon as we put that leadership word out there, we often think of these amazing, strong, visionary heroes, and we get, and you put in the resilient word and you into the dictionary and you get all these other words like um, strong, tough, hardy, robust. And we build up this image that feels really inaccessible for us. This, yes, some of these amazing leaders we've got up on the screen do experience some of these extraordinary qualities some of the time. Yet active citizen leadership is a much bigger idea than a small number of amazing supermen and superwomen who can do extraordinary things. What we noticed in our research was that for every leadership word that we came up with or every leadership property, we identified that the opposite was equally relevant at different points in time. Leaders needed to be, have a strong sense of their own self and be able to be vulnerable. They needed to be able to facilitate inquiry to find answers together and also sometimes have decisive answers themselves. They might inspire by leading out front with their vision, but they equally importantly needed to be able to create vision together with other people. Sometimes it was really helpful when leaders were building consensus, but they also needed to be able to hold and enable a whole lot of diverse pathways sometimes without consensus. They needed to be comfortable with putting those organising things that Bromwell was just talking about, the, the structures and the systems and plans, and being more like the facilitator that Lani was talking about, enabling self-organising systems and just to work with the mess of all that. With Inspiring Communities, we set out to look at what blocked or enabled active citizen leadership, or what we called leaderful communities. We paid attention to what we were actually seeing in practice. And what we noticed was that the very same things could enable effective leadership sometimes, and they could also, the very same things could block them. So sometimes when I'm in my normal facilitative self, People and trying to enable everybody else's voice to come through. People say to me, Maggie Jean, we just want to know what you think. So that's a different kind of leadership response. So resilience comes from and and thinking. 
and being able to work with all sorts of multiple truths about what leadership is, not just one fixed idea. And with that, we bring a real learner's inquiring mindset. So we came to think about leadership as a whole living learning system, not just an individual leader with particular qualities or competencies. Learning was at the core of what we were noticing as leadership. Always moving between polarities of what might look like contradictory responses. It's like the flow of the tide always moving in and out. For example, I always am moving between my strong self and my vulnerable self, especially on a day like today. <laughs> the challenge is not to stay stuck in one or the other polarity or take them to the extreme. Because each polarity taken to its extreme has a shadow side, like this rip current in the sea, which people sometimes drown in. The interesting thing about rip currents is that you have to swim in a different direction if you, to what you intuitively think you want to do. You don't swim back to shore or you're just going to be grabbed under. You've got to swim in an opposite in a, or a different direction. So similarly, our encounters with the shadow sides, the negative extremes of these polarities, are like an energy source helping us to shift in a different direction. The tensions between the polarities and with their shadow sides are actually a key part of what keeps these complex systems moving and learning. So that's an overview of some of the first big ideas. We'll just go back a slide, David, for a minute. And I'm just going to pause and ask Lani and... Um, and Bronwyn, if they've got any comments so far. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing that, that I've been thinking about while you've been talking is just um, that part of that, that kind of complexity of leadership is um, is how you judge when to move between yes. those different phases yeah. but, um, uh, and also how obvious it is usually when you make the wrong kind of movement. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's right. And um, I think it, it's about a, a mindfulness, I guess. What, what came out for me um, is... As yes, certainly you've been in those situations, and you may pick up that you know sometimes you get I get very tied up with well what needs to be done and when does it need to be done by and and um, that sort of more sort of hard stuff, and then you find you're forced into a space, and you're thinking well actually there's other things going on here, you know I need to come out of that space. So um, I, I really like the metaphor. I think it's a really useful um, my a mindfulness mm. metaphor. Mm. And I guess the words I'm mm. using for the mindfulness stuff and what, for what Lani's talking about is that ongoing learner's inquiring, learner inquiry mindset. Mm. You know, so we're constantly inquiring and discerning mm. and mindful of what needs to shift. If there's one powerful question that I keep coming back to, it's what needs to shift <laughs> because this is a movement and it's keeping on asking me inside myself, what do I need to shift inside myself or what within this group do I need to facilitate, you know, something of a shift in. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Jean, may I, I have a question for you, but and I'm also going to say to people, um, one of the things for you to know is there's about a one minute time lag between Margie Jean's presentation and your chat and your comments that are coming through the box. So what I will um, suggest you do is just jump in if you've got a comment or a question, and when Margie Jean takes a break, we'll put that too, but just jump in, don't wait to be invited. Um, and now, I, if you don't mind, Margie Jean, my question to you, we've an audience of time poor, busy people. Um, uh, why does all of this matter to them? So I guess why this matters is that unless we are open to rethinking our ideas of leadership, we mm. set up the huge idea of these extraordinarily amazing people we have to be to be able to be leaders. But if we put on this learners inquire, if we think of ourselves as learners rather than as leaders, or as active citizens rather than leaders, um, then we can actually embrace the sense that we're going to stuff things up and we've just got to think about what needs to shift. <laughs> so yes, we get scared about stepping out in that space that we discover that everybody who leads gets scared. So we can normalise those fears and say, I'm just going to try things out and I'm going to learn as I go and I'm not going to beat myself up when I fail. So I think that mind shift of getting those amazing leaders off, our peters off the pedestals is a really important part. And then what we're going to explore next is some of those different layers of leadership. So what needs to shift isn't just me as an individual. When we start to think about leadership as this whole multi-layered living system that we're going to look at in a minute, 
then we actually see that there's a whole, we've both got personal and relational things that we can do with our skills and our personal qualities. But there's also thinking about what can we shift in the culture and the structure and the systems here that actually might help everybody learn together. So some of the things we're going to talk about are something, things like the practical learning mechanisms that we put in place to not just learn ourselves, but to learn with those we're trying to make change with. Um, so we all put on the learners, uh, inquiring learners hat. Okay. So for me, the short answer is why it matters is that this is, to me, one of the pathways for enabling the leadership of everyone mm. and not just the leadership of the few. It's about the leadership of the many. And take it. Taking it a bit easier on yourself. Yeah, go gently on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> we all fail, but if we can fail forward rather than be paralysed by it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So thank you, David. We're ready to go back to the to the quadrant slide of um. So let's just have a look at these different layers. We've got the idea about leadership as learning. Now let's think about the multi-layered living, moving system uh, that we're working with here. So this is a, a particular theory of change that inspiring communities had adopted long before we started the research with them. Um, four dimensions of change, personal, relational, structural and culture. It's like multi-layers of an interwoven system to me. So we use this framework as our metaphor to start inquiring into each layer. What were we seeing? What was the sense that we were making of these different layers? You might have other frameworks that work for you, like Te Whare Tapa the same principles could be applied to thinking about it as always in movement. By the end of our inquiry, we'd added the power dimension that ran through all four of these layers. And just like the power of the sea, any complex living system continues to co-evolve, both by itself and by outside interventions. The power dimensions, like the energy of the waves, always keeping the system moving and it might range from the gentle tides coming in and out to the to the waves that we right ride to that what was in my mind last night was the cyclone coming through and you know the sense of equilibrium is only ever in any of the sea very momentarily so with our reflective awareness we think about what layer of the system might require our attention at particular points in time we usually have a comfort zone for working in some dimensions more than others. For example, we might be really comfortable at getting structures and systems and being the organiser, <laughs> um, but um, if the values and culture aren't really clear about how we do things around here or the relational dimension isn't strong, there'll be no buy-in to the action. So let's look at each one of these layers and the polarities that, that happen in each. And what it looks like when we're riding those waves, when we're being dumped by them, and what resources can we draw on to get through as we swim and surf through these different parts to influence the system as we swim. There'll be a chance, for, as Jan's already said, for comments or questions at the end of each layer. And I'm going to open it up, first of all, to Bronwyn and Lani for comments. And then hopefully we'll, Jan will be able to feed in some of your questions. So let's look at the personal layer. We identified curiosity as absolutely at the core of effective leadership, change and development. This learner, not knower, inquiring mindset brings a humble attitude which assumes we may not have the only or the best answer ourselves. I can move, we we'll go to the next slide David, I can move between my, my strong self and my vulnerable self. I can, I can lead um, with my awareness of my own self and my awareness of others, directing my own learning and engaging with others in learning. There'll be times when we tip over into our shadow sides. Our ego gets in the way. We get paralysed by self-doubt. Our control gets too rigid or our over-responsibility driver takes over. We get defensive or we burn out. Yet with a humble, not knower, inquiring curiosity at our centre, we can find resources that support us to get to shore, that guide us through the waves. When I let myself be a curious inquirer, I put on my noticing glasses, reflecting on what's going on in the situation inside me and, and with others. It takes courage to let go power and control. 
and trust the wisdom that's there in all of us. Yet as I try to let go my fear of the unknown and the unknowable, I find that I can redistribute power through engaging others as we make sense together of what we are seeing and working out what the way forward is going to look like. One of the funny um, sides of this metaphor is that I actually don't think I could ever balance on that surfboard. I don't do balance in my life at all, well, physically or metaphorically. Um, and we were just having a conversation about this beforehand. I mean, I constantly move between my energetic, engaged, busy, full-on self and my exhausted, self-doubting, vulnerable self. Um, we really um, idealise this idea of perfect balance which I find is absolutely impossible to achieve, except in really very temporary moments. Lana, you had some thoughts about that as well. Yeah, um, I've just been reading an article recently that's about the, the sort of tyranny of this concept of work-life balance and how we actually use this idea as sort of a, a whip to lash ourselves um, because it's, for lots of people it's not, not a real possibility and mm. it's... Um, and it's maybe not even that useful. Sometimes it's like this moving between the, these kind of two spheres of, as you're saying, like super busy and then super kind of crashing um, can be a really useful space for lots of creativity. And that actually maybe this idea of um, perfect balance isn't a space of innovation and isn't yeah. a space of um, sort of the creation of new things or, um, or risk. Mm. And so maybe, yeah, by idealising that idea of balance, we're potentially... Um, moving ourselves away from some of the, the really important creative work that we do yeah. as leaders. Yeah. yeah. Well, we both know that we do need some still times. And, <laughs> and yeah, I certainly do. Mm. And I'm not, so it's not saying that you don't need still times, but um, those are sort of temporary moments that might feel like the so-called thing with balance, yeah. but, but, but they're just little chunks in time. They're not, not a permanent state that we beat ourselves up for not having all the time. Mm. Yeah. Any other comments, Jan, coming through from you or the um, audience or anything you want to add from the stage? No, I guess just a encounter is, I mean, I, I do get the whole of what you're saying about the balance, but, but sometimes I think we can we can uh, emphasise and, and we feel uh, we need to put all this energy into the, you know, the energising, doing stuff, but mm. that what gets shut out are the still... Yep. You can slob on yep. the couch, see yep. in the language we use. Yep. You no, know, but you can sort of rest. You know, you can actually have um, space for yourself. That sometimes gets drowned out. Yep. And I guess the positive thing about balance is recognizing that there's not just one space or one way of operating. Yep. Mm. So we do need the yep. other. Mm. And actually, what I've said long before <laughs> I even went to these concepts here was balance is something I'm always striving for. I'm always trying to move towards mm. it, but I'll never quite achieve it mm. alone. And I think that sense that if we're working towards it and noticing it, that's really helpful. Mm. But when we feel like it has to be this fixed idea of what somebody else thinks looks like as balance for your life, that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just briefly from you, Jan, just checking anything else, otherwise, we'll move on to the relational one. No, I'm always keen for practical examples, and I was keen to know that you were talking about letting go of heroism and moving to another space. Can you think of, in that research that you've done, any practical examples of that, Margie Jean? Oh, well, lots and lots of things in the, uh, in the, in the personal space were about leaders talking about their vulnerable side and just the, the need to let go fear and vulnerability and feeling like that doesn't make you a bad leader. That's essentially normal and a, and a fantastically authentic part of being a good leader. So lots of stories about people feeling like they'd failed um, and also just having to understand the pace at which things can actually happen, that often that message of realising that, no, I haven't failed. Just stop and look and notice the things that actually have already been, have been achieved, but they might have been small things that are yet to have bigger ripple effects and, and longer-term long outcomes. So, um, you know, lots of commenting in the personal space about trusting that the little things are the big things in the long term. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's look at the next, the next layer, which is the relational layer. Um, we, I suppose the relational layer to me is like a dance. Um, we're always dancing between that leading out front space, whether we're being the, the catalyst or the thought leader or the convener with our own vision, and the leading together space where we're building a shared vision 
and every shade in between where we're walking alongside people and we're stepping right back to get completely out of the way and leaving gaps and silences for other people to step up. We move between the um, sense of just slowly in our very beginning, we know, hey, I can make some little things happen, to we can make, some, we can make things happen together. Um, it's exciting to grow the confidence to, to speak up and find my voice, but we also need to learn to listen and hear other people's voices. Relationships are so fundamentally important to, to leadership, and yet they're often the hardest things to make make happen. We can so easily get um, we can easily get dumped by the waves in this area. Uh, we can stay too long in the leading out front space and get really bogged down with the professional as expert directing the show stuff or the one man band or the oh, I'm right and you are wrong or my vision come and follow me stuff. Or at the leading together space we can get bogged down in the inertia of the group dynamics and being too polite and the challenges of working with differences or group sync where we actually don't have enough diversity of perspectives around us. Or the them and us thinking of sort of, um, they need to change, not us, sort of kind of thinking. Um, or what I remember Joe Freeman many, many years ago, I think in the early 70s, talking about the tyranny of structurelessness, um, where we had sort of hidden power dynamics going on um, between that, that were unsanctioned. So what gets us to shore in these? Um, these uncomfortable spaces are often can also be the, the driving energy for change. So often when things get uncomfortable relationally, we start to label particular people as difficult people. But actually, we can ask different questions. Complexity, in, by it, its definition, is full of uncertainty and disagreement. So a whole different set of questions can come to trying to understand people's fears about the unknown and the uncertainty of that building relationship with people so that we walk alongside them to find out what, how we could support each other, investing in relationships, bringing that empathy and engagement and our ability to facilitate inquiry, to value diversity, to bring end and thinking. Um, so in this inspiring communities um, conversation, we talked so much about small supportive things that could help people get over their fears of, oh, how do I get involved? Or, oh, I mightn't actually um, know enough. Um, I don't know why I should get involved. I don't think my contribution would be valued. Um, if I do step up, I'm worried that I might end up holding the baby. Can I, um, what's going to help me make sure that we share the effort? We get beyond those fears when we get into the walking alongside mode. There's some lovely stories about, you know, somebody turning up to a community dinner and discovering something like mescaline um, that she'd never met before, and that it was a healthy food, and it was even affordable for her and her kids. Just tiny little changes that might end up having big outcomes for people. Lovely stories about people mentoring young people, and every bright idea they came up with, them saying, okay, so you're gonna put this into practice, and I'm gonna walk alongside you with, and find ways to make that happen. Or people doing much bigger things, um, you know, getting kids in the community, helping design the playground and standing at the, at the, um, at the, the council table, um, influencing the council about their ideas for the local playground. Many, 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 many stories that really help us in that space of giving people opportunities to be apprentices with role models around who have people who really believe in them, supporting people, other adults and, and more experienced leaders stepping back and leaving space for people to try things out, to fail and learn from it and move forward. So lots of stuff there in these big diagrams that sum up all those different layers, but hopefully that gives you some ideas of some of the polarities we're moving with in the relational spaces. Anybody got a, got some other examples other than the ones I've given of in, in the relational space that come to mind? Nothing. Um, I thought of as um, a friend, um, some um, talk to the camera. <laughs> sorry, um, a friend who has a therapy background, and he, in a conversation, he's talking about how relationships are constantly negotiated. And it's something that I forget sometimes too often. But I think this is very much that space where you know you you develop a relationship, and then you go, oh yes, I know who Maggie Jean is, 
And then in the next situation, of course, given that we're dealing in very complex fluid um, environments or contexts here, you then sort of, you get a bit so sort of taken aback when you feel like the muggy jean you thought was muggy jean were actually was someone else, she's turned into someone else. Yeah. And and how actually we, we all constantly have to negotiate that relationship. So um, it's it's not something we just, we come to know people and then that's it, they're fixed mm. in stone. So I thought that that, oh uh, yeah, I think that's quite useful for this context. Yeah. So, uh, that sense that it's always in movement. It always and we always keep investing in it. We're always yeah. on that way. The tide's always moving yeah. and each wave looks, Looks a bit different, yeah. Yeah, we have to adapt, adapt, adapt yeah. differently. Yeah. Great. Um, I think one of the things that I was thinking about um, when you were when you were talking, Maggie Jean, was um, just uh, that idea of silence. Yeah. Um, and certainly in some of the the group work that I've done, where there's been large um, large gaps in conversation, um, I just was thinking about how interesting it is to see people's relationship with silence. And, and and yeah, I'm not not exactly sure how that fits into to your thinking, but yeah. Um, but yeah, how different people relate to silence and and their levels of comfort with it, and how um for in a group dynamic, those relationships um aren't just between people; they're also between uh, us and structures and our expectations as well. Yeah, and thinking time, our relationship with ideas. We talked lots in the Inspiring Communities Inquiry about how we so often think we have to be the facilitators mm -hmm. as leaders, but actually stepping back and being silent and leaving gaps and spaces and actually not intervening in situations is a kind of facilitation as well mm -hmm. that can often be really powerful in leaving space for other people to sit and step up. It's, a, it's enabling us yes, to forgive not being on top of everything sometimes, which is really freeing. It's sort of like, okay, I dropped that ball, but maybe that left a ball for someone else to pick up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Jan, just checking if there's any questions come through from participants at your end. Otherwise, we might keep moving on to the, um, to the structural layer. No, I'll just register immense personal discomfort, Margie Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm sitting here smiling, I'm listening as well. <laughs> but we um, no, but we'll keep we'll keep monitoring for comments and yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah. I totally understand the uh, immense personal discomfort with um, <laughs> with leaving gaps and silences. And in a way, um, the the slide that um, David's just gone to, which is where we're going to go with the structural layer, is really like that because. Um, the, the structural layer, um, my favourite quote from a research participant about the structural layer was, I don't mind being in an emergent mess, but it's great when some structure and rules um, emerge, and I, you know, agreed roles and, and, and a common themes or an agreed roadmap, because we do like order. Of course we like order. Um, but the reality about the, the structural layer is this, this ongoing tension between formal structures and plans and roles and agreements and you know having everything crossed off our list and being on top of everything and the much more emergent, flexible, organic ways of working. We've all got probably a comfort zone and one or other side of these polarities and yet we need both. You know, we need the, the tasks, the outputs, the, the, the deliverables and all those things, but we equally need to focus on the relationships and the developmental processes and co-creating those together. Uh, Kevin Kelly coined this wonderful these wonderful terms cockwear and, and swarmware. And um, clockwear is like the McDonald's chains, you know, where we've got the predictable rules and systems about how everything's going to tick along really nicely. Uh, or a military operation would be another example. And swarmware is much more about what we need for unpredictable, complex contexts where we can't control things and we need innovative spaces. It's like the workplaces that say half a day, day a month we're going to give people time out from their usual business just to be innovative and create. That's uh, an example of something that's really different. The point is that both are needed, order and disorder, you know, randomness and coherence. Um, and it's all about a classic example of the end end thinking, not either or thinking. The shadow sides come in when we get too rigid at one or other end. It's the siloed departments and the siloed thinking um, that gets us into trouble. We have um, to the exclusion of the others, or when we think that everything's going to be fixed and permanent, because actually we learn that any of these structures are always going to be temporary, because complex systems keep moving and changing. 
of the other side of the shadows, yes, we can get um, too messy and out of control, and that's when we get into the business, uh, where we don't have enough structures in place to really make sure that the leading together or the organic stuff is going to not completely tip into the chaos of the cyclone that we've seen this week. The best structures that we can put in place really are designing really high trust learning mechanisms in order to really maximise the peer learning across and between every different part of this, this system. It lets people step out of established boundaries and roles and across hierarchies and organisational and sector boundaries. For example, um, the way last night we had um, at a community gathering, we had people from a local, at a, at a local school, we had principals, teachers, residents, uh, community organisations, um, funders from government funders, local council people, all in the same room, uh, learning together about what was going on in different communities in Dunedin and sharing their learning. It's a fantastic example of, of people having a learning mechanism that enabled them to get strong. Plenty other examples around the country of people coming together to create community gardens or the people running food banks getting together with the, um, the people affected by poverty and getting together with the bankers and others. Cross-sectoral spaces like um, amazing stuff going on in the Portakey where the iwi are taking the lead. They're working across the community in different sectors of business and council and government, all creating some amazing muscle farming. Um, all sorts of examples where we're using the distributed intelligence out there, which we don't access if we've got our, in our, all our little silos with our heads down. Real impact can be catalyzed when people step out of those silos and engage with each other and figure out what needs to change in structures and systems and the formal rules of communities at every level. That means thinking beyond the usual allies and noticing who's excluded and bringing new voices to the table. So those intentional spaces are just, we'll just see how we sum that up well on, on the last slide as we just think about what that inquiring together does is that we're building everybody's leadership confidence and competence by having those times for actually learning together rather than thinking that a few leaders could actually do all the thinking and planning. We wonder sometimes how do those amazing leaders do all that thinking and planning? Well, we can learn together by doing it together. But we know that it's a real challenge to take time out for that reflection amidst the busyness and our passion for action. And um, in the Inspiring Communities, we had a lovely quote one day. It said, it feels like a luxury, but it's actually a necessity. So we recall, called reflective learning a luxurious necessity to remind ourselves. And lots of the work that Inspiring Communities is doing has been actually helping people put those intentional learning mechanisms in place like being a critical friend with communities, taking a regular conversation time to discuss that community's theory of how change is going to come about and asking some quite consistent inquiry questions about what are they noticing about what is happening compared to their theory and why do they think is happening and have they noticed the small little changes that are happening along the way and what's catalyzed those and how can we keep doing more of what's working? It's building those conversations and those reflective spaces in much more regularly. So I've told some stories and given some examples as we go. Let's check if Brom and Olani have got any comments and then go back to Jane, Jane like we've done before. Um, I, I think I was just thinking about um, different different leadership styles and how they relate to the, the structures that we put in place and um, thinking about some of the risk elements of that as well. And, um, for example, with, with my leadership style, it tends to be very sort of non-hierarchical, which um, in an in a amazing side can, can create these really innovative teams who, um, who work together really well and have a really kind of high engagement level. Um, but the, again, the, the sort of shadow side of that is that sometimes it can also create people who are really disengaged because that, that isn't a structure that works for them. And that uh, when you're working in that high trust model, um, that can actually lead to sort of things being missed for a long time. And it's a real challenge trying to, to balance out um, the the needs for um, for that within yourself as a leader and, and the differing needs within a team that you're working with yeah. or a group that you're working with. And how do you kind of, I mean, yeah, how do you balance that and how do you um, see, again, where those, where those gaps might be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, you'd be the classic example of the high risk taker. You know, I think we had on that big chart for just do it in a thoughtful way, and you'd be a classic example of that. You know, just lump in really confident with risk. And it's your awareness then that there's another side, there's another polarity to that mm. that other people will be more comfortable with, and that sometimes there will need to be more structure at a slower pace. Yeah. So that's the bringing the mindfulness, I suppose, that we're talking about to, to knowing your strengths and the fabulous contribution that that makes. And also know that you're going to need to make shifts at different times. Yeah. yeah. Great example. Yeah. Do you want me to talk? If, you can add if you want to. Yeah. Um, no, I think it just comes back to the nice. I think the the nice way of framing leadership as learning is that it so takes the burden off. We're just one person, and so you know. Yes, different people have different needs. And so what I, what I thought about that, Lani, was different people also contribute different things. Mm. And so if, you know, you sort of freeze at the thought of, of structure, then I'm sure there's people there who like the structure or, uh, yeah, if, if you don't have great ideas, but, you know, you seem to come to recognise in the team yeah. that there are people with great ideas. So I guess what I'm thinking here is leadership comes in conjunction with the notion of team. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so it's yep. it's distributed. You know, it's distributed around. Yep. Yeah. It's not just yep. that one. Yeah. And I think this way of thinking about leadership mm. helps people value that diversity within their team rather than problematize it. Mm. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes. That's right. Yeah. So, so Jane, anything you're in? I'm just going to ask you a question, but before I I ask for the answer, I'll also just share a resource online. So my question to you, Marty Jean, because you're such a, a, a an informed person, you've looked at so many practical examples. Um, my question is going to be: Can you give us an example of some practical first steps that people might choose if they want to engage with those wider voices? And um, before you answer me there, hopefully this will work. I'm just for those people who are curious about what they're hearing about inspiring community. Um, is this working? Can you see, Margie Jean, can you see on my screen that I just moved to the Inspiring Communities website. Yep. So if this is an organisation you don't yet know, we love these awesome people. Um, as Margie Jean describes, they are sort of collaborating on a whole different level of engagement in their communities and they're learning as they're going and they're sharing as they're going. Here's their website and look, you can see that you can uh, click this button here to receive inspiring news so if you don't hear from them regularly and would like to you can always sign up for their newsletter and um, so I'm going to unscreen share and yeah. I think that was only partially successful and yeah. um, yeah. I've just seen a myriad of screens but yeah. Margie you tell us about some examples of practical first steps well, I think that's a great practical first step is to go and explore Inspiring Communities website. In Neighbours Day might be a very relevant immediate first step for people watching this because um, that's coming up. It was actually Inspiring Communities was one of a number of groups that got together to inspire Neighbours Day, which was trying to put our focus on the little things that we can do even in our own street. Um, so for the stepping out sense of people who don't haven't done anything else leadership-wise, I mean, an example for me was... Um, just inviting my neighbours around for afternoon tea before Christmas one year when I'd moved into the street and hardly knew anything, anybody. I didn't know anything either. <laughs> so, and it was really funny how the vulnerable bit of me got in, in place, it came to the fore then. It was sort of like, oh, so what if nobody comes? Um, but just do it anyway, woman. Just print it off a tiny little bit of paper, put it in everybody's letterbox, and all these people turned up and with food. And you know, the lovely thing is, um, we've done it two or three times now, and I, I must go back on my list this week and contact somebody else who came to the last one we did before Christmas. You said, let's do something for Neighbours Day. And I'm just thinking it could be a simple, I must get hold of her um, and catch up before the end of this weekend. So we can, you know, it was only a week ahead, but we could still do it. And I'm just wondering, she's got young kids, and I'm just thinking, well, maybe we could just tell people to come for a picnic at the park down the end of our street. It could be as little as that. I think the, the stories are about people just taking a small step from wherever they are and do, doing little things and trusting that the ripple effects in the pond, you know, just one drop in the ocean, but it can have a much bigger ripple effect in the pond um, than we will ever imagine when we give people confidence to do the little things. So it's not all big grand initiatives that we're talking about here. It might be as simple as discovering mescaline or just inviting your neighbours for afternoon tea or just, you know, putting up a notice in the street and saying, come to the park on Sunday, let's have a picnic to meet the neighbours more and can continue what we've started to get to know each other. Is that enough for now, Jen? 
just just some little small steps. Okay, let's go to the cultural layer, David, and we'll look at the at the fourth layer. Culture expresses the way we do things around here and why we do things the way we do things around here. We move in the cultural layer all the time between building a really clear why purpose with groups and the sense of how, what are the values and processes we're going to use to actually get there. Between the really concrete, tangible, what are the achievable next steps, what are those small steps that we're going to actually take, and the who do we actually need to get involved. We're doing great work in the community sector at the moment about thinking about how we measure and monitor the tangible successes, you know, so we can say, rah, these are the results that we achieved. But it's equally important that we think about monitoring the how did we get there as well? What was it that we were doing? And what did we do as an outcome in itself to enable others to lead and share in that space so that it wasn't just a one-man band achieving the particular results that we've achieved? At the core of this um, cultural layer is a really important theme of the ongoing movement between the doing for and the doing with. Um, somebody said in our Inspiring Communities research, um, those with the lived experience have got to grow this or nothing will change. And that's so similar to the disability movement's statement of nothing about us without us and themes that have echoed from Māori development and youth development, as well as community-led development over many years. This whole sense of really wanting to emphasise the power of doing with others, um, which we did in our research as well, because we were all being co-researchers, is so important. And yet there's a time and a place where doing for does actually come to, into play. There's no one-size-fits-all answer for every situation. And this whole um, idea that we can replicate what worked in one place rather than another doesn't work because every context and every culture is actually different. So it's a bit like we raise a bit like raising our tamariki, our children. Uh, we can't e easily replicate the results of that, and we can't deliver results within a predetermined time frames as to when we're going to have the perfect child either. Um, we do, on the other side of this, have to absolutely let people step up at their own pace and we our job is to support and trust them to find their own solutions and their own ways of doing things differently and just like raising kids when we think we're ready to step back and other people will run the show um, something else happens and we need to walk alongside again so our framework arose out of trying not to resolve these polarities in any way to come to any neat and tidy consensus or false consensus about what effective leadership looks like. But rather we used and and thinking to make sense of the diversity of the multiple truths of what we were actually seeing and to express this as a different idea, I suppose extending really on, on previous thinking about situational leadership, to say what does situational leadership look like amidst complexity. We experimented with new language and new ways of seeing things. We were trying to name and frame the strengths of what leadership is and what we were seeing in the civil society or community space. Um, and maybe it's a bit of a counter to what we've heard for the last few decades about our sector needing to be more businesslike. Hopefully this will celebrate some of the strengths of what being non-profit-like or community-like looks like that other people can learn from and because we've got so much experience of working with complexity. So I think we should go to some, oh, go to the last summing up slide now, David, and I'm going to invite Lani to um, tell us a story of of something that she's done rather than me sharing a story at this point. But we'll just leave that slide on while Lani's telling us a story that to me is a classic example of this movement between the doing for and the doing with that underlies this culture layer. Yeah, so um, so the Thank You Charitable Trust, which is um, one of the organisations that I, I run, we've been um, doing some experimenting with, uh, with the idea of devolved decision making in philanthropy. So we're a grant making organisation. Um, and I guess, yeah, it's about we're kind of balancing with this idea of distributing money um, and um, 
moving away from linear models, I guess, and um, trying to kind of give communities the ability to make decisions for themselves. And um, it, it, it feels really relevant uh, to this conversation because um, so we're giving communities the opportunity to decide where the money goes in their community so that they have this ability to hopefully feel empowered and have a lot of control in that process um, and we can support them and walk alongside them to do that. So that's some, some I guess, doing doing with. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, we need to also make sure that we're meeting our objectives uh, and we're also kind of forcing people into this role. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're not sort of saying, hey, and do you want to participate? It's kind of part of the process. So it's, um, yeah, it's interesting trying to, 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 I guess, balance those two things. We want to, um, yeah, move away from the linear model and, and kind of disrupt that power imbalance between um, kind of grant giver and grant receiver, um, which is very much a sort of a doing for process, but we're sort of almost forcing people into a doing this <laughs> process yes. at the same time. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of um, kind of moving between those two and, and trying to balance out how much um, uh, how much people want to engage and how much um, control they have over the process and also trying to um, push them towards uh, I guess some sort of vision that we've got at the same time. Mm. So yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so your vision's pulling down the doing with end of the spectrum, but you're also just having to notice that that's an incredibly a big shift for people to um, to yeah. make, and yeah. there'll be a pace at which that may or may not happen. Yeah. How yeah. comfortable are grant recipients yeah. with the processes that we're um, we're involving them with, and how much do they want that, and mm. how much is that our vision? Yeah. You know, trying to trying to um, unpack a whole bunch of stuff there yeah. that's. Um, yeah, our assumptions and community assumptions. Mm. Just a lovely example, I think, of um, yeah, being open to the dangers of just only ever always doing the doing for stuff and just being open to experimenting with what might doing with look like. Mm. Yeah, it's great. So, Dan, we'll come back to you in a second to check just whether anybody else has got uh, questions or comments. Brahman hasn't, so otherwise we might, I'm just aware of time and just otherwise we'll move to just the last bit about complexity thinking. So any questions or comments that have come through from people listening? Priyo? Okay. So I think we'll just go to the last piece, which is really just trying to tell us a bit more about complexity thinking, which I've found is a really powerful way of fostering of analysing and of understanding community leadership and learning. Today we've used the metaphor of the tides to um, represent this whole idea of living self-organising systems that have got highly distributed intelligence if only we can access them. Davis and Samara taught me that complex systems are systems that learn, so that's why I cottoned on to all these ideas and got excited about them. There's no obvious fish in this picture calling the shots. Yet there are some conditions within the whole system that enable the fish to learn from their interactions with each other and to adapt. So we come back to this whole idea that strong learning mechanisms are needed more than strong heroic leaders to really support resilience amidst this complexity. Our leadership jobs, therefore, is to create the conditions that foster learning. And there's three key interactions that emerge from our research that we need to pay attention to, really close attention, if we want to facilitate leadership learning in any complex systems. It starts with people coming with that curiosity, with that inquiring learner mindset, the not know-it-all positioning. And then we invest in creating really high trust relationships. Over time, we build peer learning interactions at and between every level of the system, between governance, management and staff, between schools and residents, iwi, hapu, whānau, families, local authorities, communities, bankers, business people, you name it, we try to build those learning connections there. Secondly, now we've lost the light bulb off the diagram, I don't know where that disappeared, but that light bulb's beside the second point, which is that we engage people uh, with new ideas and new experiences that stretch them beyond the known and outside their comfort zones. There we go, things don't always move, work to plan. Think of the light bulb and the new ideas. Peer learning isn't enough. We've got to make sure there's new ideas and new experiences there in the mix. And the third really important opportunity is we've got to give people opportunities to get on their bike and just do it themselves. The exercise leadership in practice, and that's what builds people's confidence and competence. Um, 
from doing it, whatever level is meaningful for them, whether it's inviting the neighbours around or helping in a community garden or leading some big initiative. Inspiring Communities Works shown the power of creating new learning links between the, the community-led development practitioners and all those different people engaged. They've been connecting people across the boundaries under silos to create all sorts of amazing different things happening that we've been talking about in some of our examples and stories. The interactions are not just between people, but also between ideas and structures and cultures that collide and diverge and regroup and support the new learning to emerge amidst the action. So that's a really important idea that we might come back to. The second really important idea is that complex systems hold a mixture of diversity and some commonalities. It's not all just mess. <laughs> It's, and it's that, diverse, that mix of diversity and commonalities that creates the resource for adaptation. I think um, Lani used the word excess before. We need a whole lot of excess in the system, um, and that's what comes from the diversity. We don't want everything too neat and tidy and specialised and, um, because that doesn't help create the excess in the system. Inspiring community stories that they shared showed up some particular commonalities that are really important for us in, in community-led development context to pay attention to. So we'll go to the next slide, David. Um, the, common, the, the commonalities that were really important was getting people all on the same page about a shared vision and a shared purpose. And over time, building a really clear understanding about the how culture. How do we get there? What are the values about how we do things around here that are really important and expressed in particular ways of doing things? The diversity came in the pathways to get there, the perspectives that the diversity of people brought with them about who was actually engaged, um, the, the diversity and the particular practicalities of the tasks and the ways to get there. So I've found that quite a useful framing at times when I'm thinking about what do we need to hold in common and what can we let go of and allow to be quite diverse? Complex systems thrive far away from neat and tidy plans and equilibrium. We've talked about that a lot today. In fact, systems die if they stay in equilibrium too, for too long. So that's where we totally knock the balance idea on its head. <laughs> Logical linear plans don't always work or last. Um, the more developmental one step at a time approach the organic approach is often needed. As Margaret Wheatley tells us, order and chaos are creative partners in the process of change. Random things happen as systems self-organise without any intentional leadership interventions. Small changes can have bigger outcomes, far bigger than we ever imagined, and they disturb the equilibrium and our best made plans. Complex systems are multi-layered and always in movement and our influence is as much on the conditions for leadership to flourish across the system as in any direct impact that we might have as individuals. So let's just sum up where we have been. I'm encouraging you to think about letting go the heroic images of these wonderful people that we hold up there on a pedestal and embrace the comp paradoxes and polarities of leadership with the learners and acquiring mindset and curiosity and your capability to keep facilitating groups of people to learn together. I'm encouraging you to think about leadership as learning and your role in influencing the movement of a complex adaptive living system, not just your impact on relationships. And I'm encouraging you to keep thinking about what layers of the system need your attention or not to keep growing resilient leadership and its complexity. That's, the, that's all I want to say for now until we just check if there's any questions or comments and then we'll just go to one last slide that tells you where you can find this resource and uh, where you can find me because usually what I do is actually run workshops for people in this space. It's, it's, I'm, um, I think Garth in the last community research webinar called himself a webinar virgin. Well, I've just uh, lost my webinar virginity today. So um, you're, usually uh, we work with these ideas in face-to-face -face workshops and I'm really open to other invitations to do more of those. But yeah, before we go to that last slide, which acknowledges quite a lot of the other people who've helped these ideas emerge, let's see if there's any other questions coming through to Jan and um, or other final comments from Lani and, and Bronwyn. Uh, I, I have the screen, Margie Jean. Um, so a question that's come through here is um, how the 
work and the learning you've gathered from inspiring communities interact with the current enthusiasm for social entrepreneurship? Okay, good, good question. And I think there is a huge overlap because social effectively people working in this space need to be social entrepreneurs social entrepreneurs are incredibly adaptive and innovative so I would think I mean I would call Lani a social entrepreneur I'd even occasionally wear that label myself in terms of things that I've worked with other people to, to create so for me this learning while it's come out of I mean it grew to start with with the Unitech uh, program we were asking the graduates, what did they think it took to be a successful leader of a community organisation? And we came up with some of the ideas in this, but they were a bit static. And it wasn't until we talked about what we were seeing in community-led development spaces, which were much more flexible and fluid, like it is for social entrepreneurs as well, that we got the sense of movement and polarities and we put this overlay of complexity thinking on. So I think now we've built from two different contexts um, we're not pretending we've got the answer or a model, but I do think what it re the ideas resonate with people working in all sorts of different complex situations. I've had people come to me from government departments saying, we're restructuring at the moment and this really speaks to us. Will you come and do a workshop with us? So I think what we're finding is that we've pulled together some thinking about complexity that we've drawn from two particular contexts that lots of people will be saying, yeah, this resonates for me in terms of how nimble and adaptable and flexible I actually need to be to work in any kind of space that's moving and changing and complex. But I'm not saying we've got the answer. It's that these are ideas that people will keep adapting and changing themselves. This is what we came up with at one point in time and the ideas themselves, the knowledge itself about how to work with complexity keep growing. In fact, in the academic literature, complexity leadership theory was starting to come out at the same time as we were we were getting the, these ideas together. And I'm so, going to share some links for that complexity leadership theory and they're also available on our website on Margie Jean's page. Um, Margie Jean, I have a question though just to take you back to, um, uh, actually no, before I say that, for those of you who are leaving, because one or two people are now saying thanks very much and they have to go, please leave us a passing one-liner or a comment or uh, any any fakatoki that sort of sums up your experience of the webinar. We're really keen to receive those. Um, Maggie Jean, my question to you is around, um, you talked before about being business-like uh, versus being non-profit-like, but in fact, does it need to be versus? Are we talking about ways of working that are transferable to business sectors and are we seeing that happen? Yeah, so, so in, in, in putting in the, um, the one liner about the, you know, community organisations need to be more business-like, it's not, mm -hmm. this is very much and, and thinking. Of course we can learn useful things from the business sector. What I um, was highlighting though is that it's not just a one-way street. It's not um, what I often call the knight in shining armour syndrome, where people come from the business sector with wonderful um, ideas to rescue us in the community sector. What I'm basically saying is actually we've got a whole lot of wisdom that we've tried to draw out in this one tiny little way with this research that actually other sectors can learn from as well. Businesses face complex situations where their previous ways of working don't work for them too. So seeing this as much more of a two-way street, um, a multi-way street where each for each thing that we've learned is true and works well in one space, it may or may not work well in another space. And we can learn from what's the wisdom in that space as well. Does that make sense? Am I being clear? Yeah. So I wasn't throwing in saying that we shouldn't be more business like there's a time and a place in a situation where those business ideas have been really helpful. But there's also a time and a place where being complexivists um, can be really helpful. And it might look to other people as incredibly messy and incredibly risky and and not good business management at all but sometimes they need to know that that's actually what works within this space. So we might be experts at being complex of us and not, we don't need to be judged by that as being incompetent, I suppose is what I'm saying. It's actually being very competent about working with very complex stuff where we've got a lot of ambiguity going on that we've learned to be comfortable with. And that, I suppose, is one thing I haven't mentioned today. That sense of being comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty, mm -hmm. I think that the community sector has learned a lot about 
and it is a core competency for working in something where there's never going to be a simple um, straight line logical linear plan that's going to get you to big visions of changing the world uh, or changing communities. We do that one step at a time. For those of you who are interested in Margie Jean's work, I hope that this screen sharing is going to work this time because we had a strange effect. But if you go onto the community research website, you can download, and I'm sharing my screen with you now, you can download Margie Jean's full piece of work called Civil Society Leadership with Learning. So that's a resource for you on the community research website. So there's more where this came from. Um, and let me unshare now and oh, take us back to Margie Jean. Um, we have a few people. Are, are leaving now and are thanking you for the work. Margie Jean, can I ask you what you'd like to do with all of this thinking next? Where will it take you next? Okay, so maybe I'll talk while David shows the last screen um, on the, um, which has got some of the acknowledgements that I want to actually make as well. So, um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge that the people I've already referred to who've taken part in, in this. I also want to acknowledge my two amazing PhD supervisors, Marilyn Waring and, and Elaine Mayo, who got me to graduation on, in a fairly joyful ride. Um, they said had its ups and downs and there were waves that dumped me, but if it wasn't for them, um, yeah, that got me to shore. Ian Friendly, whose photographs we've actually had on these wonderful visuals, and he was also my helping my novice learner of, of um, putting the, the design of it together heaps and heaps of other authors that are actually there. So the, the Civil Society Leadership is Learning one that um, Jan's referred to. That's the whole PhD, uh, and you'll find tons of references there. But you'll also find a shorter paper that I did for the ANSTIA conference last year called Resilient Leadership and its Complexity. So hopefully between all those resources, you'll find, um, find some other answers. So what was your question, Jan? Remind me of the question. <laughs> what do I want to do with this, was it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. okay. So what I suppose I want to do with it is that um, I'm not so much an academic as a pracademic. Um, my passion is for learning and in supporting other people's learning. So actually running workshops with these ideas or using these ideas within um, the, the kind of work that I do with helping community groups facilitate inquiry. I haven't got around to making a business card yet, but it's going to say something like facilitating inquiring, facilitating inquiry, learning and leadership is my passion. So often I get roped in to just be helping to design those learning mechanisms with people that are going to create the containers for the conversations that need to happen, that help people see where they what the next steps are for them and moving forward and what they're trying to change in the world one day at a time and one organisation or one community at a time. So I hope this has seeded some ideas for people. Um, I'm not expecting that um, you'll have found understood all of it but maybe there's just little particular pieces like the the diagram about the peer learning and the bright ideas and the bicycle to, to, to practice it might be just little bits like that that you decide to grab I find I come back to some of those sorts of pieces or the four layers quite often in my thinking when I'm trying to figure out what needs to shift what do I need to do next so that's that's where I'm Leaving things. And I don't. I, do you want to, I'll hand it back to you, Jen, to finish up. I will do. I'm sorry. I just faltered there because I'm not sure whether people are seeing me or my screen share. So, in the case that it may, it may be that you've got the wrong screen showing. I wanted to invite each of you just to sum up what for you leadership means um, within the context of today's webinar. Maybe we'll just one closing comment from each of you. Oh, okay, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about asking no questions. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do I sum up in three words? What an hour and a quarter? Um, well, I think yeah, it's shifting. It's shifting the concept of leadership very squarely into learning, and it has to be because of that complex space. So I'm someone who has to walk between you know very much for-profit worlds and not-for-profit worlds and I think Maggie Jean's hit it on the nail, is that this is the context that we we live in, you know, increasingly. Um, and so this is really a, a really productive way of thinking about leadership, both on a personal level but also on a on a more sort of conceptual level, really, if I could put it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Uh, and I think um, for me, this has really highlighted that idea of um, of, of leadership as learning and um, of maintaining that sense of curiosity in, in all of the leadership um, opportunities that, that we all have all the time. So kind of, yeah, really focusing on that, that idea of curiosity and attention. Cool. I suppose I was coming back to the who me. I don't think of myself as a leader. So that we started with, and I feel like to me it's the journey from that to yeah. I, I see myself as an active citizen. I'm comfortable with being a learner, and if that produces me being a leader, I could actually even embrace the leader title. Yeah. Mm, very good. Margaret Jean, Bronwyn and Lani, again, I hope my face is showing, not my slides. It's been fantastic having you here today. Um, I'm here with Peter, and thanks so much to all of you for interacting. Um, community Research will continue to run webinars, we hope, using Hangouts on Air, because we think it's a great way of, learning, of sharing our learning within the community sector and from the community sector and to the community sector. And by that, I mean the Tangata Whanua community and voluntary sector. Um, we're going to immediately share the recording of today's webinar on the YouTube, on the Community Research YouTube page. So feel free to jump on and share it and re review it. Um, and also, you'll be receiving a short survey. Let us know how we're doing because uh, we learn as we go, just as Margie Jean's presentation has suggested. So, Margie Jean, thank you for the wisdom, the moments of discomfort. Thank you for creating an intentional space a digital space where we can together come together and share our learnings. And we're looking forward to working with all of you in your next step. So thanks from all of us and we'll see you at our next webinar.